I'm going to go through, uh, you know, what has been a lifelong passion for me, which is marketing. I have three passions, uh, the study of love, marketing, and hip hop. Three very different things, but um, those are my three passions. So I'll be talking to you about uh, marketing today. And uh, as I go through, even though we're going to end up talking about purpose, I wanted to give you a little bit of context on my career journey. And the my career journey is a, is really a good um, proxy for how purpose has evolved. Because as I've evolved my career, the brand work that I've done has become more purposeful. In the beginning, it was much more practical, right? And so uh, you'll see that evolution. Uh, and feel free to jump in and ask questions at any, at any time, right? But that's just kind of the flow so you can see the arc. So if you look at my career, it really, uh, when I talk about marketing being a passion, this um, ad is really about a story. It's a story about when I was coming to, um, I just got a job offer from PNG and I was on, I'd, on my way for my house hunting trip. So I was going to find an apartment, right? So I went to P, I went to Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, did apartment shopping around, found the perfect place. Um, and then I was returning on the Delta plane back and I was reading the Delta magazine, right? This was pre Twitter and getting all <laughs> and digital and all that stuff. Um, and actually 1993. And I looked at the magazine and, and saw this ad stood out it was yellow this ad doesn't show the yellow properly and it said you finally have a real job a real place and a real girlfriend how about a real drink and it just i i fell in i was like how did they know i was here like how did they know to plant this magazine ad exactly at this time while like these marketing people must be geniuses to because this is it just spoke to me um directly and so this is when I fell in love with kind of how do you, the, 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 the art of getting the right message to the right person at the right time, right? Um, and, and that really what is what started my, my love and, and passion for, for marketing. Now, what they were really doing, and I didn't know this, is that they were solving a real problem, right? They were, doers were solving a problem of not being relevant with younger people like, I was then, not now, uh, as you see by my COVID beard, I've grown in here. Um, but the, the, the problem that they had was people had shifted, um, young people didn't really appreciate scotch. So I was their target audience at the time. They also wanted to reach out to single um, women. Uh, and so they had that kind of opposite ad, you know, reversed here. Um, how about a real boyfriend? And then, um, believe it or not, you'll learn to love it. You know, so this was a part of marketing solving a problem. And that's very functional. It's a functional problem to solve. And that's where I began my career, solving a lot of functional problems. So um, you know you love marketing when you're working on the fix it brand as your first assignment in marketing at Procter & Gamble. And um, I was working on fix it my one of my best friends at the time was working on Pantene. So we didn't have cell phones, but he, you know, he'd write me an email through the system or, you know, I'd, call, I'd talk to him at night and he'd say, wow, you know, Vince, how, how are you liking, you know, PNG so far? I'm on a, um, a boat right now with Tyra Banks, the supermodel who was a young supermodel at the time. And we're shooting a Pantene commercial. What are you up to? I said, well, I'm in a focus group in Kentucky watching people take their teeth out and put them on the table <laughs> and complain about them not being able to bite an apple. So even though we had two different experiences, I loved brand management more than he did. I, I just fell in love with it because it was solving problems by convincing consumers to do stuff. Um, and think in a certain way. So that's when I knew I really love marketing. Uh, talk about functional problems. Keeping your teeth uh, in your, in your uh, mouth is a functional problem I started out solving. But functional problem, you, ha you have to sleep with a cold, NyQuil, right? So the big idea at that point, the general manager of my category when I was assistant brand manager at Procter & Gamble, his name was Tom Blinn. He said, it's all about your power equity. What do consumers 
think when you wake them up in the middle of the night, what are they going to say about your brand, right? Fix it in. You fix it in and forget it. That's the campaign. NyQuil helps you sleep with the cold, right? Um, that was, that's, what, that's what these brands delivered, right? And that's what we were taught to deliver. And this just gives you a glimpse of my managers because each manager that you'll ever work for in marketing has a problem. And you can both solve it functionally and you can also solve it with purpose. But your job as a marketer is to help the CEO, the you know, brand manager, the marketing director solve their problem. So uh, eventually my career took me to Crest uh, Tooth, what was called Crest Tooth Whitening Strips at the time that I showed up. And the proposition, you know, was, you know, dental whitening that was as good as a dental treatment of whitening um but we had to convince people that this was actually going to work so the story here and the shift that we made is that um you know i walked into i actually bleached my top teeth and not my bottom teeth because people didn't think that crest white strip was would work and so a lot of people had bleached their teeth this guy paul sago he bleached he, he had used so many crest white strips his teeth were like glowing transparently white almost like let's so i was like i didn't want to go that far and so but just showing people white teeth didn't really work because they said your teeth had always been white you know how did how do we know crest white strips did this how do we know toothpaste didn't do this so i used whitening toothpaste on my bottom teeth and I used Crest white strips on my top and I was a walking demo. So uh, it, I would show our, you know, my leader I actually ended up showing our CEO, you know, check out the difference. And then people looked at the stark difference between my upper teeth and my lower teeth. And they said, wow, this thing really works. So we got a lot more investment and people listening to white strips at that point. I would show dentists, I would show everybody. Um, and so um, that again is this functional benefit that Crest was bringing, Crest White Strips was bringing to life. Um, and that is the role of a marketer is to put that entire proposition together. So the name we came up with, um, the how are you going to visualize it on the package so people know it's not a toothpaste, it's actually a strip. So if you see this picture here, we show the strip coming off of the package. We people would be confused how to use it. And so we put the how to use information right on the package, right? Um, and we actually sold direct, which is probably 1999. So it was one of the first brands to go direct to the consumer, not going to Walmart um, for at least about six months um, and, and, and went direct. So that was another kind of breakthrough at the time. But again, functional benefit. White Strips is also still going. Um, story about Pepto-Bismol. Um, can you all, uh, let me, I can't go to, I, can I go to a panel view? Let me see here. Ah, that's more of a panel view. So can you all raise your hands? I'm looking at the panel. If you think Pepto-Bismol is for heartburn, raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's for upset stomach. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's for diarrhea. Don't be bashful. Raise your hand if you think it's for nausea. Okay, got it. So let me go back off of that view. So what my statistically significant research that I just did told me was that everyone thinks Pepto-Bismol is for something that their mother gave it to them for, their father gave it to them for. But the truth is, is that Pepto-Bismol is actually for five things. And so that was the big uncover. So as a marketer, you need to figure out what is the truth that you can uncover from the brand. Most people call that an insight. And if, and once, and, and once you know this truth, if you communicate that truth to people in the way that they know the truth, that would really make your business take off. That's the job of a marketer. That was the job of white strips. What do you have to say about it to make it really break through? For white strips, it was that it worked 10 times better than toothpaste, right? Um, and, and it got beneath the surface of the teeth because it stayed on the teeth long enough. That was the unlock. So we focused on that. On Pepto, the unlock was that we found out in focus groups, everyone raised their hand for different things. But the truth is it works on five symptoms. So that was the strategy, five symptoms, one product. So we gave that strategy to the agency. 
and they came back um, with, I don't know if this will, this is not going to play probably, but I'll just show you the commercial they came back with. It may play without sound. Or may not play at all. Let's give it a try. It's a Thursday. We're feeling lucky. The YouTube has to do a lot to go back to 2003 and find a All right, so, I mean, not let, the, how do I stop this from playing? Let's just stop that, I don't know. Okay, and that's another iteration of the commercial that would have come up here. So let me try to get back to my slideshow. Okay, so is everyone still seeing this now? back okay so that example was just how you take that strategy and insight and then you bring that to life in a very entertaining way that that makes people get and understand what you understand and we we aired this commercial in i guess 2000 and probably two three or 2003 and the business was declining at about six percent a year the commercial was on for about eight weeks and the business began to grow at four percent a year it is just it, this one thing was the only thing that we changed didn't touch the price didn't touch the package we changed this one thing in our advertising and it turned the brand around 15 years later the brand brought back the campaign uh, which you may have seen because it still was the clearest way to communicate right cover girl i'll give you a quick dip here um that was CoverGirl before uh, my team kind of got to the brand over the decades, right? Um, pretty homogenous, uh, um, pretty uh, bland in kind of diversity. Um, and then the big unlock, the thing that people didn't know is that the CoverGirl name, people who were on the covers of magazines, that it shifted who used to be on covers of magazines or models. You didn't really know their names. Uh, maybe you might know, a, you know, Christy um, Brinkley, or maybe you may know a Tyra Banks, but the, you didn't really know their names. You just knew these beautiful faces. But then things changed. The covers of magazines shifted, but the brand hadn't shifted its talent strategy. So the, color, the covers of magazines were actresses, dancers, singers, right? Um, they weren't just models anymore. Well, here you do have a past model who became a um, celebrity. But these were the new people that were on the, um, on the covers of magazines. So we went out and hired those people. We hired Rihanna, hired Drew Barrymore, we hired Queen Latifah, and that became the, we hired Ellen, right? Look at the diversity of how, you know, and hiring Ellen back in 2008 was actually a controversial thing back then. So these were the faces of cover girls the unlock for our, the brand was cover girls have changed and let's introduce the new cover girls to the country but let's not, not just do that let's change mascara from projects pro products that all look like this to products that looks like look like this so game changing innovation right for samsung and then we'll take a break because these are all the functional the kind of the functional examples and we may get some questions and i'll move into what is more purposeful but again samsung the difference here you know we had apple this is very insightful so the unlock is that with apple it was a great phone but your battery didn't last long right so this idea was about apple users in the airport you may have seen it trying to find a plug for their phone and they were all huddled around these plugs because their battery wouldn't last. But of course, the Samsung phone on the left had a longer battery life. Uh, it had a power save mode, right? Um, and and you, it had a, at some point a replaceable battery where you could pop a new battery in if you had a spare. So we brought that side to side to life and this advertising scored better than other advertising did. All right, so um, th then you get into 
things that are a bit more more purposeful. So I'll start with one. This is just a Smirnoff side by side when I worked at Smirnoff on how we move that brand functionally to be more in line with its credentials as a historical brand and also innovation. So functional is like, what is your core, but also what's your innovation? But in, in, in Smirnoff, we started to change because the world had changed from being so functional. Tito's had come along as a vodka that really is about like Smirnoff. They actually source their vodka from the same place as Smirnoff sources its neutral grain um, alcohol, which makes the, the, the vodka. But they, people believed in Tito's. It was something about them. They were, you know, they were um, being authentic and talking about, you know, roots in the American culture, right? And they were giving back to dog charities, right? It wasn't about the quality of the vodka. So something has started to change. So at Smirnoff, we changed too. Instead of talking about just the functional properties of the vodka, we, we really understood that our purpose was to bring a spirited good time to everyone. That means not just one type of people, but everyone in an inclusive and diverse way. So we went to every country and really brought this to life. In India, it was about women entering the dance floor and women weren't allowed on the dance floor at some points, uh, but they were, they were entering the social scene in a more equal way. Um, in um, Brazil, we talked about when different music started to come and change the scope. Hip hop, we talked about in the US when, uh, and, and, and in South Africa where hip hop became the kind of, um, drink of drink of choice and we talked about that diversity in music and this was when we started to evolve to be more more purposeful so before we get into purpose a little bit more let's just pause there to take any questions okay if anyone has any questions they can enter them into the chat box okay Lillianette has the first question here so i'm happy to read that out um, being that you've worked for different companies that are also in different industries, how have you been able to learn about the purpose of a particular brand in a manner that allows for the marketing to remain innovative and authentic? Yeah, the, um, the search for purpose is a great question. And the search for purpose really comes down to the DNA of the company. So, and the DNA of the brand. And it's mostly about the founder, right? So if you go back to the founder, no matter what category it is, the founder had something in their mind that really is your first hint into the, into the, the brand. So for Smirnoff, it actually started uh, Pierre Smirnoff um, with the goal of, he, he, was a, he was making vodka for the czars in Russia. But what he found was that, and, and they were very expensive, but he tried to figure out what is a formula of vodka that you could make that will be just as good as the stuff, good enough for the czars, but also manufactured um, in a way that was efficient enough to give it to a lot of people, to make it for everyone, right? So that was the first little hint. So we took that for everyone and said, well, Smirnoff has always been for the people, for everyone, right? And so we just gave that a new 2018 view of what for everyone meant, which is this more diversity now. Back then it was more hierarchical in class. But again, I had never worked in the spirit category before, but I uncovered the DNA of what the founder had in his mind. When I worked for BET, the founder of BET saw that there was a home for, um, let's see, a kids on television. There was a home for um, older people. There was a network towards seniors, right? But there wasn't a home for um, the U.S. Black audience, right? So his, his, in his mind, it was, well, what if we could be the home for the Black audience that would help to move the whole country um, you know, everyone, but, but from being this rooted base of the home. So that was in the media industry. We went back to what the founder thought, what the company's DNA was about, right? Um, on CoverGirl, I didn't tell you the purpose story of that. Not only did we change the functional benefit with mascara, but on CoverGirl, we went to the DNA. What was CoverGirl about? Well, when you first saw 
CoverGirl come out, it was the first brand that was in drugstores, not just department stores, or from the Mary Kay salesperson. So what it was doing was democratizing makeup for everybody. Kind of like Smirnoff was, I've worked on a lot of democratizing brands. So CoverGirl was giving you that CoverGirl look, but making it for everyone. So the purpose that we uncovered, and I'll, I'll, I never say we, the purpose we wrote or the purpose we gave, because you don't write, you just uncover the purpose. So the purpose that we uncovered for CoverGirl was we exist to give every woman that CoverGirl feeling right? Not just the people in department stores, not just, just the people with makeup artists, not, but it's everyone. That's why it's in drugstores. That's why it's in Walmart. That's why it's, you know, we make it available at a price that's affordable. So no matter what industry, I'm industry agnost agnostic at this point. I've been in different industries, but I go back to what makes that brand core, why we exist. Um, and so that, that's kind of the, the, that gives you a little bit of flavor. Any other questions? have come through there are a bunch more yeah um, good i love tough questions okay so shuba asks um kind of building off the last question is uh was there ever a time where a company decided uh they needed to change their brand image because of a socio-political situation and what was that experience like yeah so i think cover i mean cover girl was one of the examples right so if you looked at I didn't hit this overtly, but if you look at the people that you see being advertised for CoverGirl, there was pretty much one type of woman with some exceptions. So CoverGirl had broken a little bit of ground with some of these early ads in the 80s, you know. Um, but there was a movement of diversity that was existing in the, in the country that CoverGirl hadn't reflected yet in its brand and you just have to make sure that your brand is reflecting what's happening in society to make sure it's relevant and so while this wasn't a an a acute point in time like we're dealing with now post george floyd this was something that was out there that was more shift over time that we had to address and then of course look at the cover girls that we ended up with and the diversity so that was where we were more, let's look at the trend and jump on it proactively before an acute incident popped up where we'd have to be more reactive. Um, and then I think sometimes companies go too, too far. So I think, you know, if you look at where Smirnoff was, um, and you, you can, I don't have an example here, but Smirnoff, we actually do have at the bottom, right? So the purpose when I got to, to Smirnoff that they were, they were um, following was Smirnoff exists to bring inclusion to the world, you know, or to support inclusivity. And while that was a good value of supporting inclusivity, it wasn't really the DNA of the company, like including everyone in, in on that party was, but not supporting inclusivity for inclu inclusivity's sake. And so we had gotten a little bit too far in just talking the inclusivity message, especially in the U.S. where we had no credibility in that, at least in, in, in the recent credibility. So that kind of wasn't, it was not connecting with people. So we brought it back to just being more inclusive and Ted Danson and we had um, Laverne Cox in an ad here that reacted to that social situation and brought diversity into Smirnoff but it was in a way that fit with the brand, not was just an extraneous statement that we were making about inclusivity. Okay. Do you want to take more questions or do you want to move on to the next section? Let's take another one as a transition. Okay. Um, Faye asks um, about some of the examples. Um, so in some of them, you change the brand image and in others, you change something like the packaging. So how do you identify which part of the brand strategy to change? So I think, uh, well, that's another good, that's another good point. I'll just jump into this slide and I'll segue myself back into that answer, right? So you really have to look at where culture is and you, where you're, con you just have to look at the C's, right? So you need to look at what your competition is doing. You have to look at your customers, your consumers, what 
do they like about you? What's, what's, what's green, what's yellow, and what's red, right? You have to look at what cultural lens you're looking at and what's, where are you fitting right with culture, green, and where are you kind of behind culture, like our cover girls, red. You need to look at your company. What does your company need to sell more of to make more money, right? So when I showed you that lash blast example, this product doesn't really, it's cheap to make, from, it wasn't from CoverGirl, it's from Maybelline, but you can only charge $6. When you put it in a, when you put mascara in a tube that's differentiated, you make it orange and you give it a big bristle with extra benefits, innovation, consumers like that more, they're willing to pay more money. So your company makes more money. So what is your company? So culture, company, consumer. Um, and also your customers like Walmart. What does Walmart want you to do? Well, Walmart wants you to sell more of the Lash Blast also, so that gets more people into their door. So your customers need this innovation. So when you look at all those Cs, you figure out what's green, yellow, or red, and then you construct a synergistic, holistic plan for innovation and branding and go-to-market strategy based on all those C's, then you figure it out what to change and what not to change. So that's the answer to that, that question. And if I segue, this is kind of, you know, um, you all wanted as, as we kind of prep for the meeting to know a little bit about just what kind of marketing is out there and what do you need to go into. When I talk marketing, I'm talking brand management and brand management sits at the center of these three things. So it's, it's first and foremost, business because you're the brand manager in charge of making profit for your company. So you need to analyze, understand things. Uh, what levers do you pull on the brand? Where do you go up and down to kind of make that profit and make more revenue? What are your stretching goals? That's a business mindset. So if you're a business minded person, that that's what it's going to take in brand. But it's not just general management because you could be a general manager here selling widgets that, have, that has no advertising and no brand and still check off business. But brand is about ideas and new idea generation, innovation, idea improvement, execution, um, and brand enhancement, brand value growth, right? That's where the ideas, agency, um, communications. So if, you're, if you just like the ideas part, you may be better suited to go into an agency and work in communications, creative account, or strategy. If you like the business part, you may be better suited to just go into general management. If you like the people part, which is building genuine relationships, you manage up, you have to sell people. This could be more of an HR, you could be more of a consultant where you go in and you kind of, you know, sell your idea, bring concepts together, but you don't have to own the business, nor do you have to own the brand. So you could be a consultant that works in marketing. So depending on where your, where your skill set passions lie in business, then it, you can kind of figure out which part of marketing you, you could go into. But brand management sits right squarely in the center. Now there's something new since I made this chart called performance marketing, which is prop is really along the lines of business, which is how do you, go and acquire new people into your proposition. Um, and that's probably more business and, and a little bit of ideas in that performance marketing. And those are a lot of jobs out now that are very lucrative that don't require a lot of big idea generation and campaign creation, nor a lot of people skills, but it's, it's really um, driving ROI through acquisition. So, that with that, I'll give you just a little bit on a little bit more on purpose. So I don't know if this is blocked on your screen, so I'll move it down. So what you do, so that functional thing that you do that I talked about, that's your mission. That's what do you have to do to survive? That's if you're in a military mission, remember it, military mission, what must you do? What's the, what hill do you need to conquer? What do you need to do to make sure that you win the war? The basic functional blocking and tackling. But your purpose is not directed at your troops. Your purpose is uncovered and it inspires your troop, right? Your purpose is the story, um, as the story goes, there's 
people building, um, putting bricks together and they're stacking bricks and the man person walks up and he says, Hey, what are you doing? The person says, I'm stacking bricks. And he, he just does it. Like he has a, just a look on his face, like this sucks. And then the next guy he walks up to, uh, and he says, what are you doing? And the person says, Oh, I am, you know, building a church. And that person was like, you know, a little bit happier, right? I was like, okay, I'm building a church, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm okay. But the third person that he walked up to, he said, what are you doing? And the person said, I'm saving souls. He was still putting down bricks, but he said, I'm saving souls, because he knew that by building this brick and building this church, people were going to come in and then be changed forever, right? So purpose is that, what, how is your company saving souls? Now, not to that extreme, but what's the closest your company can come to saving souls, right? So the best example in the industry ever is, of course, everybody points to this brand, which I love, which is Nike, right? So their mission is to, I think it, it does, is innovate, um, and leverage, innovate, and bring in the best athletes in the world to give the highest performing um, and emotionally connected athletic gear, right? You know, so we want to innovate and inspire through athletic um, gear. So that, that's their mission in so many words. But their purpose has changed over the years. Their saving souls is we innovate for the athlete. Well, that wasn't very much saving. So that was in 1980, but then, and they didn't call it a purpose then. They, and then they said the first purpose statement, I think that someone has on record is probably, we, we exist to serve all athletes and everyone's an athlete. So that was very purposeful. That, that was goosebumps because they had women participating in sports that they haven't participated in before and, and, and all the you know, different people coming together and, um, um, hand, you know, sports um, for impaired individuals, and they were rocking and rolling, right? But then they even evolved and said, our purpose is to use the power of sports to move the world. It's actually not move the world for it. It's just move the world. So that's their saving souls. That's their purpose. Now they've actually, they're so evolved, they actually have a purpose um, sustainability specific effort and in that effort their purpose is actually to leverage sports to make the world more inclusive but that's a double click into their purpose and then when you look at how they show up they show up you know this you know football player with one arm and then of course they did Kaepernick now and then they're they're doubling down behind COVID and Black Lives Matter everything goes back to them leveraging sports to move the world forward so that's Nike so first is the mission, and then comes the um, the purpose. So let's open it up for questions again. Let's talk about this thing called purpose. Everyone clear on what purpose is? Any questions on purpose or just how it comes to life? If you have questions, enter them into the chat box. I heard this group was not shy on questions. So. They're not. Well, there are questions in and here. You can even ask one live if someone wants to come off mute. Oh, yeah, and if you do, just raise your hand and um, we can get you off mute if you want to do that as well. I can see the brave souls. For all. <laughs> well, we do have a question from before that maybe you can tackle in the meantime um, about in-house versus agency. And, um, you know, especially now that everyone's trying to make their uh, leaps into the industry, what would you recommend for someone just graduating college? In-house versus agency, so meaning working for the company, you know, the actual brand, right? Versus, yeah. versus agency. Mm -hmm. um, I think, again, it goes back to that diagram that I showed before, right? If you are working in-house, like at a P&G, at a Unilever, at a Facebook, uh, right? So do you see a block on the bottom of your screen? that's blocking these three circles? You don't? Yeah. No. Oh, great. So I see your faces so I can look at both without blocking the screen. So you're, if you're 
working in-house at an agency, you're going to not be attached to the business results. I mean, if you're in, in-house, you are. If you work in an agency, you're an agency for the brand, but you're not the brand, right? So you're not owning the day-to-day share results. And you don't see, I made a commercial for Pepto, and then nine weeks later, the share, the, the, the business grew 6% versus decline of 4%. You see it maybe from the agency, but you're not directly controlling pricing and promotion and and making that happen that's what you do when you're in brand management in the brand running it in an agency though you also get experience across different brands like you could work on eight different brands at at one time on an agency right you can be on the creative side you can be on the account side and you're learning from a lot of different brands so by the time you show up to your new brand you have a lot of perspective from a lot of different brands versus in-house you don't move that much now i moved a lot being in-house because PNG lets you work on 80 different brands, right? Uh, in a lot of different countries, but um, it just depends on in this circle, how close are you to the center? When you're in the center, you want it all, right? You want to, you want to, talk pricing and promotion and placement in Walmart. You want to packaging all the P's you want to control those P's and purpose, right? The, the latest P. Um, and think of it as controlling all the P's to manage all the C's, right? <laughs> that we talked about before. So that's where you is brand management. Um, and, but, you know, it just depends on where you want to kind of play. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions on purpose? We have a couple of uh, career questions in here. Okay. As well. Love those. That's everyone's mind right now. Okay. Well, Leela asked um, that uh, beginning uh, your career is difficult because of high levels of competition um, that almost necessitates going to like ad school or taking an unpaid internship, which creates a barrier for diverse students. Um, so how do you recommend breaking into the business and what do you recommend for underrepresented students looking for a job, especially now during a pandemic? Yeah. You know, we need to do better as an industry um, with getting people to know about marketing in general, and then especially with getting diverse candidates to know about marketing, just even to have it top of mind. Because my daughters, which you, you can't see the pictures behind me, but I have three daughters, five, seven, and nine. And they're growing up with two parents that work in, worked at P&G and brand management, right? That's very rare right over the years and decades of, of people been this so they they're looking at commercials and anal- reverse engineering the strategies you know but we have to get that out to more people um and so the industry needs to do a better job of it. so a and a is the kind of body of advertisers on the in-house side like the body of um, client side advertisers um they are they have a lot of programs they're working on to get that, you know, to get that word out. Um, I think, so that's the heavy lifting that needs to be done. I think right now, especially companies are really opening their eyes up to um, going different places and recruiting, recruiting based on um, the need to have a workforce that resembles the um, market that we want to market in. And, but as far as an individual, I mean, I came out, I went to Dillard University. So I went to a historically black college a university in New Orleans and people went down there recruiting because that's who they were trying to find. Uh, and, um, and I've been working, you know, you know, almost 30 years in the industry since. And so I, the, I had internships, they weren't in brand management, but your goal, you know, now it's not really issues. If you want to be a marketer, if you can get a subscription to ad age and brand week and look at how brands are marketing and study those brands and, and be more knowledgeable about how brands are linking their activities to purpose and read all the books out there on marketing and purpose and link. And then, and then go and then start to get experience working for somebody, helping them do that, whether it's a nonprofit, because I know it's harder now to get in a lot of these jobs, but excelling academically, focusing on leadership, leading organizations. That's how you get into places like PNG and Unilever. It's excellent because all three circles, what they, what I didn't put there is it's leading business, leading ideas and leading people. 
So if you can lead in whatever you're doing in your church, in your um, organization, being a leader and then having this passion for figuring out business problems to solve as a marketer. And number three is practicing articulating and communicating your thinking to people with well-reasoned rationale points, right? That's, those are the three things people are looking for. Leadership, you know, um, academic excellence, um, and then, uh, ex, ex, you know, marketing passion and, and, and f, you know, f passion for figuring out uh, different situations. Um, that's kind of what the, the formula is to get into a lot of these, uh, a lot of these companies. Do you want another question? Or? Let's do one more before we jump to okay, the next great. example. So Maya asks um, about uh, uh, brand purpose. Um, and although you should be changing with culture and targeting the current situation, sometimes when a brand does it, it appears superficial. So how do you find that balance between adapting to culture and then also remaining authentic? I think, uh, Maya, the, the perfect example of that is, um, is Smirnoff, where you have to, uh, a good purpose, right, comes from finding the intersection, right? I don't have these three circles drawn, but either draw them yourself or imagine them and seal them into your um, cognitive memory. The circles that brand purpose sits in the middle of, right? It's what are you doing for the consumer? Which, you know, to super serve your consumer, what are you doing for the consumer? Um, what are you doing for the, what's your, what are you doing as a company? What do you need as a company? What do you, and then what does society need? So when you can match up what society needs that you can benefit authentically to, what your customers need, your consumers need, um, and what your company needs, that's when you are playing in the right place with purpose. So where and all of that has to be with authenticity so where Smirnoff went went I think arise at the person that was there they were really into inclusivity for inclusivity's sake and and their definition of inclusivity was getting um, different ethnicities to be knowledgeable of each other right now while that is an aspect of getting you know being a vodka that's for everybody and bringing people together around a good time that wasn't really a good enough time. Like that wasn't what the brand was about. The brand was about good times and everybody, but we had a spot where there was an albino in, in, in Africa going to a village and he was being shunned by people. It just wasn't a fun thing, right? But it was from, from Smirnoff and I call it, that's a PSA from Smirnoff. That's not a, that's, this is a provocative story brought to you by Smirnoff. It doesn't have to do with our brand's core. We, we needed to bring everybody around a good time. So the line that the advertising, um, campaign that we ended up coming up with was um, it was everyone's invited. I loved it when I first heard it. It was actually out there before the purpose got articulated because a lot of times your brand DNA is going to be activated even before your purpose comes here because you're just uncovering the purpose that was already there. Your brand's already acting out on something. They just don't know it yet. So they had a brand campaign called Spirinoff, Everyone's Invited. And that just says everything. I mean, two where everyone's invited, Smirnoff. So when you're having a flow in South Africa, um, everyone's invited, all different people. Now, the albino could come too. Like that could be a part of the, <laughs> the everyone's invited, but it wasn't the story about the trials and tribulations of the albino walking through a village alone and getting shunned by people. Like that's not where the brand had an authentic right to play. So that's an example of, um, where you have a right place to play and a wrong place to play. So those three circles, what good for you, good, good for the company, good for the society and good for the customer. And in the middle of that is this authenticity that your brand can bring that other brands can't really uh, bring. Does that make sense? Yeah. My, okay, cool. All right. Let's go on a little bit. And so we talked about the, gold standard of all nike so bt's brand mission um was to kind of threefold it was to entertain to engage and to empower 
right? That's the mission. That was, that's what they have to do as a network television station to and then digital in order to keep the lights on. That's their mission. That's their what. Um, but we're, oops, let me just go back. So if you look at that, the mission, what can you be passionate about? What meets economic needs and what can you be the best at? And they, that, that's kind of where they, they fit. Um, and then, but that's the what, the why, the purpose was I talked to you about before is this is what a good brand purpose will deliver. Employee engagement. So the good thing about brand purpose is you do one thing and you get five benefits, right? It's kind of like Pepto-Bismol. You get one thing and you get five people dancing, right? Employees get engaged. It brings distinction versus competition. So Smirnoff can be distinct in that because at the Ciroc party or the Kettle One party, everyone's not going to be there. Puffy is not going to, or Diddy, whatever he calls himself now, he's not going to let everyone behind that velvet rope. Kettle One, everyone's not, not going to care to be in that scene that Kettle One is in. But Smirnoff, everyone's invited. So it brings this distinction. It fuels your business goals. So the more people that are in a place having fun and having a good time also is good for business, right? It's good for the world because people coming together, you learn about each other and the world moves forward. And it's also a brand truth. It's been there before and it'll be there now. I told you about the Smirnoff's founder story. So that's the, the Smirnoff example. So at BT, how would we solve for all these? It's by being the home for black culture that moves us all. Right. So that's what we came up with as a purpose. And if you look right now during the two pandemics that we have with, you know, economic justice and COVID, BET has been out doing those specials, bringing people together to have a home to talk just about the concerns of this community because there's no other home doing that, not that exists to do it specifically. Um, so that was it. That was, those are younger pictures of me just showing how I had no idea that I was being marketing. Um, and I ended up there. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So let's get some more questions out while we have, while we have time before I have to jump on an, another uh, WebEx. Yes. So um, there was a question here uh, again about purpose. So once you've identified that brand purpose, um, who do you have to convince uh, the most to say that that's the direction the brand should be going in? Oh, wow. That is a great, who asked that question? Jason. <laughs> J Jason? Jason. Yes. Yeah, one of my Jason. Favorites. Great, great question. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 I won't say, the question is not just a good question. The question is a timely one because the, the meeting I just got off of was a meeting with my, um, my CMO and my, you know, and then we're having a meeting. It was our CEO, um, and it, it, and it's about brand purpose. And at BT, the the person that you have to convince is the person who leads the company, or the brand. So if you're a company like PNG, you don't have to convince the CEO of PNG because that's a house of many brands. You have to convince the brand leader of the brand, right? So of the Tide brand, or of the Safeguard brand, or of the Crest brand that person has the, that person runs the brand. So, but in a company where your brand is your company, like a brand house, branded house, like American Express or BET, you have to go convince the CEO. And again, the CEOs rarely initiate brand purpose in my experience, because the CEO got to be CEO because he or she is really good at directing and giving missions. They see a vision, they give a vision, they tell you how to get that vision accomplished by giving you a mission and you go off and do it. And you're inspired to do it because they're a great CEO and you trust them, right? That's how it works. But a purpose is a new tool for a CEO because you, you don't direct people with it. You don't say, here's your purpose, you go do it. Here's, your, here's where you're going, you go to a purpose you just uncover. And it has to be true and authentic to your history. So it's a, I call it an archaeological dig for a purpose. You don't just have smart people come up with it. Like the CEO is a smart person. They come, up with a, they come up with a vision and a mission. You can have consultants. They come up with your vision and mission. 
but purpose, you have to go and look back at your history and archives. How have you been talking to people? What have consumers thought about your brand? That's where marketing comes in because that's what marketers do. So marketers lead the archaeological dig to find the big bones of your purpose. So the big bones in Smirnoff were good times and everyone, right? Because it was at a price point that everyone can afford and it's good about good times and vodka, you can mix with everything so everybody can come because it's mixable. So we went through that archaeological dig, finding those big rocks. BT, oh, what does BT mean to you? You do focus groups. Oh, BT was home. BT was like, I'd go back home and watch BT. So, okay, this home thing kept popping up. So, oh, okay, BT, home, right? So, um, that's the journey that you go on as a marketer to uncover for your CEO the purpose. But then the problem is the CEO has to buy into it and then give the message to the organization because the marketer, if the marketer gives the message to the organization, it's going to become, oh, it's a new campaign. No, 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 this is not a campaign. This is why your company exists. So the marketer influences, uncovers, and then influences the CEO and the executive committee because they have to carry out the purpose to the organization because the purpose is not a marketing thing. It's a business thing. How does your business deliver on this purpose, right? So that's where the conversation has to go, right? And, and the best way to do it is to take your leadership team on the journey with you as you uncover things because the hardest thing you're trying to, to try to do, and I've met with this a lot, is we've done the exercise, we've come with a purpose, and then you go to a cold, um, you're calling on a CEO cold and say, hey, here's, here's a purpose statement. And they're like, what the, what is that? What do I, why, why are you bringing me, that's not a mission or a vision. Well, is, so, so you have to, so bringing them on their journey uh, is a, 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 work, a way that makes that work um, more, more smoothly. Okay, um, there are a couple questions here from Shuba and Crystal about um, books that you would recommend or podcasts or influencers or YouTubers or any kind of content that you would recommend for them to check out. So when it comes to um, function, I'll start there because the best book in the world is a book called Good to Great, right? So Good to Great. Um, and it is about... Um, the companies that have been the most successful and what have they done, right? And there's just a lot of good business principles. And it's not a marketing book, it's just a good, how businesses win and how they focus, right? Where they play. And it's just, it's so, the tr so many insights and truths from that book. Another book, it's not a book, so the Harvard Business Review published about three months ago, an a, ex uh, a excerpt on purpose. So um, if you, it's a bird on the cover of it, okay? So there's a yellow bird on the, on the cover. So if you go and you search for uh, uh, Harvard Business Review purpose, um, it's gonna come up. And it is just the best um, synopsis of what brand purpose means that I've ever, uh, encountered right it's just really um it just really nailed it when it comes to um what what brand purpose is about and how companies uh use that i can't believe it's not coming up but it, you'll if you search for it, it's a yellow bird on the cover um and it's the it's the quarterly report on um on brand on brand purpose I just knew that trick was going to work and I was going to impress everybody when how uh -huh. uh, it came to the surface. Um, but it is one of the best I've seen on that, um, on that, on, on that topic. All right. Any other questions? Um, let's see here. Uh, do you have any tips or uh, are there any aspects of the industry that is not common, commonly known, um, especially for, for students <laughs> as they enter their careers? Any tips for marketing that are not commonly known or to get into marketing? Yeah, to get into marketing. You know, I think, you know, the, the best way to get into marketing is to get an internship. That's just the best, uh, the best um, way in, I'd say. 
um, because of the because of the, 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 the that's where the pool is that most people are going to draw from when it comes to um, when it comes to hiring people. Um, I think the other aspect is more around um, finding you know, making yourself useful to people that are in the industry. So I, I'd say joining up with like the ANA and you can join the ANA as a student member. And by being in that group, you're around thousands of people who have jobs, right? And how impressed would I be at seeing a person in the ANA as kind of a student member and wanting to know that much about um, the marketing profession, right? So getting in and reading, Ad age, ad week, brand week, um, going to, you know, getting involved with any A and A type activities. Those are just great ways to place your it's all about proximity, right? Placing yourself where marketers are. Okay, great. Well, I think that's about it. And I, I'm aware that you have a two o'clock meeting, so I don't want to take too much of your time here. Uh, but thank you so much. For joining us this afternoon, especially right before Fourth of July, I really appreciate it. I uh, learned a ton, and we're so happy to have you. So thank you, Vince. Um, next week, everyone is a session you definitely will want to sign up for. We have uh, Dave Byrne. Uh, he's director of strategic relations at TikTok, and um, he he's a really cool guy. He actually uh, led up the Toastmasters group at Google when he was there previously, and he talks all about uh, storytelling, so how to sell your brand, your company, and even yourself when you're looking for a job. So you definitely want to tune into that one. Uh, register on our site. I'll be sending out the details for that. But I just want to thank Vince again. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you all stay safe and healthy and enjoy your 4th of July weekend. Yeah. This is this is great to do. I'm looking at the mosaic view now of everyone uh, together. So great uh, group of, you know, talented um, diverse, uh, you know, smiling faces that give me uh, hope for the future of uh, the, the industry. So feel free to reach out um, on LinkedIn, you know, follow people also on LinkedIn that um, that you may you know, kind of want to keep track of or that are in interesting industries. That's another way to just kind of stay connected with what's going on. So good, good luck and uh, God bless. Take care. Bye everyone. Thank you. <laughs>